I want to start with two things that I think are very helpful in dealing with anxiety, and that's an attitude of uh, gratitude and humility. Gratitude, I want to thank Alan, uh, first of all, for trusting me to, uh, after a very brief phone conversation where I just threw out some very rough ideas as to how we might approach this topic, having some faith that, uh, that actually this might turn into something that would be useful. And I guess the proof will be in the pudding and we'll see if, if that worked out. But I, I, I appreciate you trusting me, Alan, and also all the board members who didn't probably know me very well at all um, and trusting that, that this might be a program that would be worthwhile. I also, in particular, want to take this time, and please bear with me for just a moment, to thank Roland. Uh, Roland's been my friend for three decades and a colleague. And Roland is a definition of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. He's, he's, he's a walking uh, realization of a spiritual center. Uh, when my, uh, and <laughs> he's also Irish, and so yeah, he's, 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 he's funny and fun. And, um, but I, I just share with you an anecdote. When uh, I was living in Ohio, and uh, my wife, who was 52, suddenly got a brain tumor, and um, without really even being asked, Roland got on an airplane, flew uh, to Ohio, uh, was there with me uh, through some of my darkest hours, uh, helped me pack up a house with an eight-year-old and a dog and various things to move to Houston to take a job at the uh, Houston Young Center. Uh, that's my definition of a friend. Uh, it's about deeds, not words. Um, and that's been continuous over, over the decade since then of, of just having someone that you can fully trust. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you, Roland. Um, I have no doubt Roland will hear some things in this presentation tonight and go, God, that sounds familiar. It's probably because I stole it from him at one time or another in, in one of our many conversations. Um, I also want to touch on humility, which I think is very important in these times. Um, let me tell you what I can do and not do tonight. I realized when we first started to kick around what this was going to be that I had attached myself to a lightning rod because inevitably as we started to bring things up, there was a lot of emotion around, around this topic. And I'm very mindful that many of you sitting in the room tonight, you know, we're all coming from different places, different situations. Uh, many of us are probably carrying some degree of anger, some of us probably some despair uh, about many things that are going on culturally and politically, um, and also hopefully some hope. Uh, I actually am very humble about what I'm going to be able to accomplish tonight, and I want to be clear about that. I'm a psychologist. I'm a depth psychologist, and I'm going to explain what that means. Um, but I, I'm not going to be able to solve all the political problems of the land that we live in right now, or the world. Um, and I'm going to resist the temptation to utilize this podium as a soapbox to try to address those. And I'm going to encourage each of you, even though you're carrying these very potent emotions, um, to try to listen with an ear towards developing tools to address those things that happen outside of here. Because that's what I can help with. That's, that, that's what my practice has been about, is focusing on how do we develop tools to understand at a, at a deep level how we individually and in relationship and in groups and in community, how do we project our own emotions onto others? How does our own uh, unconsciousness about our shadow end up getting put onto others? Uh, and oftentimes in, in very emotional ways. Uh, and so I guess I just want to say that with all humility. Uh, I'm not going to solve all the problems that you've walked in here tonight. But I hope to give you a few tools that you can take with you and then go out and apply those. And hopefully we'll get through some of my slides towards the end. But I'm going to give you a hint here, a couple of hints at the beginning. Um, one is... Um, we're going to be talking about, particularly tomorrow, we're going to be talking about some very specific types of tools that you can use to manage anxiety if you're working in the mental health field, which is right out in the front lines or in a faith community in terms of dealing with the anxieties uh, that are present in our society right now. 
Um, so tools are important, but I'm going to just tell you right now the punchline that I'm going to get to at the end tonight. If you're not connected to a greater source, you're going to be anxious. And that's going to be, you know, if you need to leave now, that's okay, because this is, this is what I'm going to get to over a 25-slide build here, is that while I can give you tools to help to make the ego feel safer, to try to exercise some of its frustrations, its fears, um, I'm going to try to give you a, a way of holding that. But ultimately, my experience and, and the experience that I've had in working with hundreds of clients over the last two decades is that uh, there's a second center in us. And that second center, whatever you want to call it, the greater self, the higher self, God, as you know it, uh, Buddha nature, um, a, a, a creative influx in the universe that seems to move life along. Um, if you're not connected with that, the rest is going to be like spitting into the wind. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, after I've seen clients all day long, um, I have to find some way to connect to that greater source. And so that's, that's what we're going to work towards. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the scope of uh, some terms here to help define how I approach all of this. I'm what's called a depth psychologist. I studied um, at Pacifica Graduate Institute out in Santa Barbara. I did my dissertation on living, living with chronic and life-changing illness. Um, but I studied at that program because Joseph Campbell used to teach there. The Joseph Campbell Library was there. And that's why I flew from Denver out to uh, California every weekend for three and a half years. Campbell was interested in what are the larger mythologies in which we live. And he was also a, really not exactly a colleague, but went to many of the conferences with Carl Jung, who I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, that is depth psychology. In other words, it goes beyond ego psychology. It goes beyond... Uh, cognitions uh, and studies of the brain and behavioral psychology. It tries to look at the relationship between spirituality and psychology. It tries to do that not within one particular tradition, but from a comparativist point of view. So that's just the ground from which I'm going to be speaking. And uh, I hope that it'll have something that, that, that speaks to you, and I, I hope it's not offensive to just tell you that is who I am and that's the ground from which I'm going to be talking. It's very Jungian, uh, hot and cold, love and hate, joy and sorrow. Jung believed that all of life consists of these oppositions, apparent oppositions. And he also said that uh, we can't escape our cultural conditioning. And for those of you who aren't familiar with his work, he was one of the originators of modern psychoanalysis along with Freud. Born in 1885, died in 1961. Many of his concepts have become just part of everyday language. Uh, that his typologies, which have picked up by Isabel Myers in the Myers-Briggs test, are you a thinking type, a feeling type, a sensing, or an intuitive? Are you an introvert or an extrovert? That all came out of Jung's study of why he, Freud, and Adler seem to view reality so differently. And he went back and, and looked at historically how these typologies seem to show up uh, throughout the world and seemed to be something that was universal. He's also famous for his theories about archetypes, that there are core patterns that are universal, that are grounded in our very physiology, and that you can see those in the world's religions and the world's mythologies. Recurrent types of themes, um, whether it's uh, one of resurrection, um, one that we're approaching here rapidly, uh, the return of the light, which is another reason why I was drawn to this idea of shadows and light. Um, we're about to, we're coming up on the shortest day of the year, and you can imagine our ancestors wondering, is the light going to come back? You know, are we going to have food in the spring? And various rituals that were developed around the fears of our ancestors at this time of year. And that is part of our experience. Uh, this time of year, I always see a real proliferation of depression. And some of it has to do with cultural 
experiences of the holidays, um, which were never as ideal as they were supposed to apparently be if you look at Christmas movies or the cover of Saturday Evening Post and the Norman Rockwell paintings. Most of us grew up with other types of experiences, some of them joyous and happy and other ones disappointing and even downright depressing. Perhaps a parent who died at that time of year or um, some sort of trauma that happened. Uh, this is all Jungian thinking as to what is the archetype of that, the return of the light. I mean, nobody really knows. I don't think they were keeping records on the day when Jesus was born. But we celebrate the 25th because the 25th is very near the solstice. And we know that for, you know, going back to the Egyptians and Babylonians and other types of civilizations, this was always a time of the year where shadow and light was of great concern to people. Um, so Jung recognized the polarities that are indicated in this Joni Mitchell song. And what he said is that people who are unconscious of the shadow, the shadow that exists in us, project it outward onto other people. And it becomes an other. And to accept your shadow, um, you cannot be an enemy to your shadow. So that's going to be a theme. Uh, this is a quote from Dr. Young, who, by the way, was as influential in uh, comparative religion and mythology as he was in psychology. Some of his uh, philosophical works are um, very influential today. And some of you may have read them in theology school. Anyone who perceives his shadow and his light simultaneously sees himself from two sides and thus gets in the middle. He knows the world consists of darkness and light. I can master their polarity only by freeing myself from them by contemplating both and therefore reaching a middle position. Only there am I no longer at the mercy of the opposites. In this world, good and evil seem to balance each other. And this is the reason why the victory of the good is always a special act of grace. Next slide, please. If you can't see these, I'm going to be reading them, but I think you all have handouts. Um, and certainly you can look at them later. So before we go any further, I just want to take a moment and gather as our own collective unconscious. Anytime groups gather, you know, they create an energy field. Uh, we know this. This energy field can be positive and it can be negative. It's why when you go see a movie in a theater and you see a comedy, the humor is infectious, right? It's funnier than if you're just sitting alone in a room by yourself. Similarly, if you're in a soccer match or a football game or the World Series and somebody gets violent, that can be infectious. Consciousness lowers in groups. And that can be good or bad. Sometimes it creates a, a kind of a group feeling where we experience things outside of that kind of lonely, narrow shell that we normally walk around with of the self. So just for a moment, I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes lightly. Um, put down pens if you have pens. And I want you to just take a deep breath. In through your nose and then slowly out through your mouth. And any of you who have ever done yoga or any sort of meditation practice know that just trying to keep your back straight is helpful. And let's do that again, just breathing in through your nose and slowly out through your mouth. Just let your body kind of settle into the chair. It may not be the most comfortable chairs. Let your body make any adjustments it needs for its relaxation and comfort. For the next few moments, your thinking mind that you used to pay attention doesn't have to do anything. It can come back once we finish this exercise. Just let it relax. You don't even have to listen to every word. Let the sound of my voice go with you. as you just settle into being here tonight in this room with others. A 
And you may notice the sounds of the room, the heating in the building creaking or the movement of someone else or the distant sound of traffic. Just let those be. They're just part of the background. And I want you to just stop to notice the stream of consciousness of your thoughts. Just imagine them coming downstream. There may be a proliferation of thoughts. Thinking about the day, things on your to-do list, irritations, Without judging them, just notice your thoughts. And it does no good to yell at your thoughts to stop. But you can let them slow down and slowly unwind. And I want you to imagine your thoughts coming downstream or down perhaps even a train track or a streetcar line. And there's always another one. If you miss the car, just wait a little bit. There'll be another one coming. And as the next thought comes down the line, I want you to just notice it. Let it register and let it go. And soon there'll be another thought. That's what our minds do. See it coming down the line. Just notice it, let it register, and let it go. Now, just for fun, I want you to just imagine, I wonder what the next thought is going to be. Just creating a small little space there to wonder. See the next thought coming. Let it register. And let it go. And now just See if you can hang out a little bit longer in that in-between space. I wonder what the next thought will be. Just patient curiosity. Notice the next thought. Let it register. And let it go. Now, if we were to practice this a bit longer, you may start to wonder, am I the thoughts or am I the awareness behind the thoughts? What is it that observes them coming down the line? What is that awareness? Where does it come from? We go through life throughout the day thinking we're our thoughts, identifying with them. They all seem so real. We start to think we are our thoughts as opposed to the vehicle that somehow takes experience and turns it into abstract thought.
So now just gently, when you're ready, allow yourself to come back to the room. And when you're ready, just opening your eyes. Thank you. Is everybody back? So I'd like to suggest that humans are not so much rational animals as rationalizing animals. Once an unconscious decision is made, the neocortex tries to rationalize it. And in a moment, I'm going to explain how that works uh, from my conversations with some uh, neuroscientists. Um, what can happen is that we tend to split thoughts into inner and outer. I don't know if any of you had that experience, uh, just as we were kind of quieting the noise and, and noticing. Thoughts, by their very nature, have a dual quality. All language is, is binary. You think about nouns and verbs, it's, it's this doing that. Um, we tend to divide the world, in part because of the way our nervous systems are hardwired, into these types of dualities. After all, it's either off or on. Computers are designed based on our own archetypal experience of, of the way things, signals work electronically and chemically in us. It's either off or on, off or on, these kind of binary uh, turns from one side to the other. Uh, some of you may have heard, I, I was asked to do a radio interview uh, with Maeve Con Conran uh, earlier in the week. And she asked me, well, what are you going to talk about? And I said, well, one thing I'm going to talk about is splitting. And splitting is a very primitive uh, kind of defense against unknowing and anxiety and ambivalence. When uh, an infant is first um, becoming conscious, um, there's this idea that when it's fed, the mother is good. This is the good mother. This goes back to Bowlby and people back in the 50s in London who were doing studies on attachment theory. And <coughs> child development. And they hypothesize that the good mother is when the child feels okay, and the bad mother is when the child feels empty and overcome with fear, because after all, it may be alone in the universe and it may not get fed, and everything could, could be very frightening after all. And this is a very primitive kind of primal defense against the anxiety and ambivalence and change of the world, because the world is always changing. Change uh, is experience. So this very early uh, defense of splitting is then followed by projection, which we're, we're going to talk about, which is, okay, I can't, I, it's either good or bad, good or bad, good or bad. That's like a switch, switching back and forth, until eventually the switch starts to blah, 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 blah. Um, Then the child sort of learns to project out, like, okay, the good is here and the bad is out there. Now, what I'm going to be talking about tonight, the reason I have this here, is I think these have become prevalent in our cultural system right now. And they're primitive defenses against anxiety. Uh, splitting so that there's a good group and a bad group, white and black, us and them, whether the other is across the sea or trying to you know, break into our neighborhood and our gated community. This is splitting. And projection is when we take something that is something about ourselves that we don't like or that we've been taught by our cultural milieu as something that's not acceptable, and we put it out there. That's also a fairly primitive defense. Um, with love and kindness and support, um, a child gradually learns how to hold more and more ambivalence, more and more of uncertainty and unknowing, and be able to tolerate that. But we have certain pathologies in psychology where people just didn't get that love and support, and so people go around still splitting. And we've all had that experience, either ourselves, because we all do it at times, or um, you know, a coworker that drives you crazy, or God forbid, a partner, you know, and, and you have hands-on direct experience. It's very easy to see that when you live with somebody else on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm gonna just start by saying, these are things that I'm now going to explore a little bit 
back from some ideas of Jung who talked about these in the 1920s and 30s. So these ideas have been around for a century now. So I need to define some terms. What is unconscious? Um, people talk about, well, unconscious. You're unconscious. You should be a more conscious person. So I just want to define it a little bit, and I think it'll help you get hold of what does it mean to be more conscious, and how is it that we get caught in these traps where we're trying to do anxiety management systems to deal with the stresses of the world, uh, but actually we're just creating more problems. So unconscious is not a mind that's separate from ordinary waking consciousness. It's not something that's going to be found in an MRI or, you know, you're not going to dissect a body and find the unconscious. It's more like uncola. It says what it's not, right? The old advertising campaign for 7-Up was uncola. So I'm, I'm dating myself here, but some of you, as I look out across the room, many of you might remember uncola. So, um, when I was in Houston, I was the director of the Houston Young Center for uh, about six years, and it's the largest Jung, Jungian educational center, really, in, in the United States that's geared at popular education. They do over 200 classes and programs every year, and I was in charge of that committee, <laughs> a curriculum committee, to try to develop those. And one of the things that we did every year was we had an annual fundraiser, and we would bring in speakers that hopefully would bring in big donors. And uh, one year we had David Eagleman. Some of you may know a book by David Eagleman called Incognito, which I highly recommend. And uh, David also did a program on PBS called The Brain, which I also highly recommend. You can go back and watch it and you'll learn a lot about neuroscience. So he was gonna be our guest speaker and so I thought, well, I'll go visit him in his neuropsych lab at Baylor University in Houston. So it was, it was kind of like, top secret stuff. I had to get a badge to get in. And I, I wanted to bring my son, who was home on vacation. No, no, he can't come in. Uh, you know, you have to get approval ahead of time to get into the, the Baylor Neuroscience Lab. So anyway, I managed to get in there. And when we got in there, we started talking. And, and David is a wonderful, very affable young man, uh, brilliant. Um, and so he's saying, well, why are you interested in this old Jungian psychology? This is stuff from the 20s and 30s. You know, the, the, we've done so much research since then. And Jung died in 1961, so obviously uh, some of his writing is going to be out of date. And I said, well, you know, one of the things that I read in Jungian psychology is the power of the unconscious, that consciousness actually thinks it's in control. It thinks that it's, you know, the, the person that's making all of the decisions. And um, I said, you know, Jung speculated that 60 to 70 percent of the time, decisions are made by the unconscious. And then consciousness realizes it. And, and he's listening to me, and I thought he was going to argue with me, right? And instead, he says, no, it's, it's more like 80 to 90 percent. I, I have research to show that. which. And this is coming from a neuroscientist who's doing, you know, research in terms of how people react and how quickly they react. And one, this, this comes from David. He says that about four-tenths of a second before we're aware of any conscious decision, unconscious processes have already decided the outcome. And it goes up into consciousness, and then consciousness makes up a likely story to say, well, yeah, that's why I decided that. So think about that for a moment. We go through the week thinking we know who we are and we know what we do. But much of the time, at least half the time, in my estimation, maybe more according to David Eagleman, um, these are being decided. How are they being decided? By patterns. Patterns that are determined by neural networks in the brain and that can take all of our history to develop. And we all have a history. We all have certain experiences from the time we're little, and we have that experience with mother. Good mother, bad mother. Good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. Every thought is a pattern of neuronal firing. It's an interaction of relational associations, and it's also a metaphorical symbolization. The conscious and the unconscious are of a piece. They're, they're all of one thing. So I wanted to kind of define that term. Unconscious is not some weird metaphysical thing floating out here. Unconscious are all those processes that are going on in us and around us that are outside of the little tip of conscious awareness. Okay, so I hope that demystifies. And what's 
interesting is Jung said that the ego itself is a complex. He said a complex is a string of associations that have developed over time around a core. Um, I call it a meta pattern. Um, if, if you look through the literature, you can see how the metaphor changes over time. <laughs> Jung and Freud called these things complexes, which are just patterns of associations. We live in a computer age. People very much now like to call them neural networks, neuronal patterns of firing. Um, the ego itself, Jung said, is a complex, or what I would call a meta pattern, or it's a habit that nature has gotten herself into. And so the way I really try to start with these talks is, you're more than you think you are. And this is also how I work in therapy, is you're so much more than you think you are. Because what you walk around with, who you think you are, is based on all these earlier experiences, all these other neural networks that got connected. And because they're associated with memory, we create kind of a stable abstraction of identity or self. And that's what you carry around. And somebody asks you and says, you know, who are you? It's actually a pretty profound question. Um, we might answer with, well, I'm a psychologist. Or, you know, people love to put you in a box or put a handle on you. So I'm often introduced as a Jungian psychologist. Um, actually, I'm just as influenced by my studies in Eastern philosophy and Buddhism as I am Jungian psychology. I'm sort of a comparativist. But we need to kind of organize the world into these discrete chunks. And so that's, that's what our minds tend to do. But I, in this slide, what I want to get across to you is un is only un with respect to the little thing that floats on top, that little bit of consciousness, which tries to organize it and which has a sense of identity that it carries around with and thinks that that's who you are. Does that make sense? Does that surprise anybody? Because you, you see the implication of that? That who you think you are is a habit that you've gotten into? It's pretty powerful in therapy because it could be different. The habit could be very different. So this self-conscious purposiveness, which has will and is attached to memories, it lacks the evolutionary wisdom to which unconscious processes may still have access. It's organized in terms of purpose to enable to get what you want. I describe the ego as the organ of safety. The ego is organized around keeping you safe. Um, and to keep you safe, it kind of migrates between desires and fears, desires and fears. Amazon knows this. So you get onto Amazon and you get that little notice. Oh, you might be interested in, they're tracking your behavior and they're either gonna move you with desire or fear, right? The internet is a dumping ground for this. Desire or fear, it's called clickbait. Just look at the headlines in the morning news. Do the desire or fear, desire or fear, desire or fear. Well, that kind of interferes with our wish for equanimity because it triggers those neurons, right? And so it helps to sell product, but it does not help us to act with maximum wisdom. And I'm gonna propose to you another metaphorical image. The ego is a metaphor. It's a hypothetical point. Again, it's not gonna be found in any uh, PET scans or MRIs or anything. The ego is a hypothetical orientation point by which we organize the patterns of our experience. Um, I believe that we have another centering principle, another organizational point, which Jung called the self with a capital S, but which I'm gonna to refer to as the source. That there is another active energy in us, and you don't have to believe me, I'm gonna ask you to reflect on your own experience. Do you have something in you which is not motivated by fear or desire? Because that's the ego's domain. Um, I call that higher source or power, which is really God language. I mean, we're here in a church, this is, uh, I think spirituality is in the name of this organization. So is it okay if I talk about these God things? Uh, I'm not going to use the term God because so many people have been wounded in particular experiences in childhood by their family or by organizations. But I'm just going to ask you to suspend some disbelief that you might have another force in you, which, here's how I define it, is constantly moving us towards higher levels of integration, creativity and wholeness. 
It's not about perfectionism. The ego tries to be perfect about all the things, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that. This, this center is not interested in that. It's interested in integration, integrating all the different experiences that you have and creating a sense of stability and wholeness. It's not motivated by fear. In fact, the ego oftentimes gets in the way of spiritual searches because it's motivated by fear and desire. And we have to give the ego something to do to move out of the way so we can have these other experiences. So this is just a premise. Stick, hang with me, and we'll just see if any of this fits with your experience. Uh, this is a gestalt. I'm sure all of you have seen this somewhere, Psychology 101 somewhere. You know, the gestalt pattern where you look at it and you say, oh, is it a vase or is it two faces about to kiss? Why did I throw it in here? Because this is the way we typically organize experience. And it helps you to see that it's hard for us to see beyond dualities. You can't see both at the same time. Now, this is a limitation of the way our perceptions work. Okay? You can see two faces kissing, and then you can kind of blink the other eye and squint a little bit and say, no, no, it's a vase. But most of us can't see both at the same time. I threw this in just to show the limitations of ordinary consciousness. It's limited by our sense organs as well. We all know that the eyes can only take in a very limited span of radiation you know, and, and light. Uh, we don't see ultra red, we, uh, ultraviolet. We don't see um, rays that are outside. Uh, cats can see things at night because they have different sense of perceptions. We can't smell certain things. We're limited by, by those doors of perception. Splitting, as I said, is a very primitive defense against the chaos of the world because the world is constantly bringing in all this information and we can only take it in, you know, kind of in a linear bits at a time, like that exercise with the thoughts where I had you imagine it was like cars coming down the line. That's the way the ego works. That exercise that we did, which is called thought stopping, is designed to get the thoughts to slow down because they operate like this. They operate like one at a time, followed by another, followed by another, followed by another. That's another habit that nature has gotten herself into. We try to defend against the flood of all the possible things that we could be taking in. And we have to chunk it down. We have to kind of put it through a funnel, through our senses and through this habit called the ego. We defend against the reality of the fact that much of the time the world is filled with ambivalence and ambiguity and anxiety. And I'm going to be talking about defenses in terms of management systems of how do we manage that chaotic feeling. And this is what anxiety is. Maeve asked me, could you define for our audience, Dr. Rule, what is anxiety? And I said, well, it's worrying about the future. That's all I could get in in a very short kind of radio interview. But it's also sort of all this information coming in and not knowing what is important and what should I pay attention to. And it's sort of a sense of overwhelmment. So what kind of, what, how do we defend against that? How do we manage it? Well, we have all kinds of systems, don't we, in terms of managing that feeling of overwhelmment and ambivalence. Um, some of us may go for a jog. That's a pretty healthy way. Um, some of us may reach for the remote control or, God forbid, the smartphone. Um, what we find when we pick up the smartphone is that there's more of a string of more ambivalence and more anxiety and more decisions and more choices and more fears and more desires. And it's designed to proliferate that, to create a dopamine drip in your brain so that you're like, right? And our young people have grown up with that. Now, they supposedly have a capacity for multitasking, or so my 22-year-old son tells me. Oh, I can do multiple things at once. But what the actual research shows is they can't do that effectively. That it still has to kind of funnel down into certain uh, modes of responding. So psychologically, or this is really from psychoanalytic research, a very early defense against that overwhelmment is splitting. We say, OK, good mom when I get the milk, bad mom when mom is away. It's been speculated that fairy tales probably developed because that was the way psyche worked. This is a Jungian thing that archetypally these stories developed because psychologically we experience as children the bad witch who puts us in the oven, the good witch who feeds us and is nice. The problem is 
when fairly unsophisticated people or very sophisticated technologies go to work with these things for power, profit, manipulation, and control. And that's what we're seeing right now in terms of social cultural issues. Splitting has become epidemic in our society. Uh, the good is over here, the bad is over there. Now, I tried to indicate that I'm not going to get on any political soapboxes, although it's very tempting. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to probably try to rein that in also, or otherwise we're just going to get into a, you know, there's something to be said for a session where we just, you know, let it all out, but it's not going to give you tools to kind of understand this, I think, at a more sophisticated level. So please understand that that's why I'm kind of trying to not get on that soapbox. But I think most of you have the experience that splitting is something that's happening a lot in our society. All you have to do is turn on the news. Shadow. This is another term. Shadow is Jung's term for that inferior part of the unconscious that potentially could be made conscious. In other words, certain things get pushed down by your family of origin, the culture you grew up in, the subculture that you grew up in, and the, the period of time in which you were born. These can be unpleasant, unrealized aspects of ourselves, like, Johnny, it's not good to hit your brother over the head with that truck. Uh, that's probably a useful thing to get put into shadow, like controlling some of those aggressive instincts. Uh, but some of them are just relative and pretty arbitrary. They get pushed in as unacceptable impulses. Oh, that's shameful. We all carry around with us a long bag of shadow stuff. Some of it might be useful to get in touch with. The problem is we tend to not want to look at it in ourselves. We tend to put it onto other people. You know, the old story of the scapegoat was when they, the village would take the sins that they didn't like and put it on a goat and push it out into the desert. Well, that's a way of talking about the shadow. That's a way of getting rid of it. Every side, society and family pushes some aspect of experience into this unconscious shadow. And what happens is, well, first of all, we have symptoms. Uh, Jung famously said we have symptoms instead of symbols. In the old days, when there was more of a kind of a religious orientation to things, there would be an orientation that, oh, this is the desert, the, the, the devil, or this, these are demons, or these are spirits. Uh, now we call them neuroses because we're so rational, because we live in a rational society that no longer believes in spirits. So instead of uh, the kind of thing that I experienced when I lived in Bali for a short while, where you would leave a certain building and you would make a kind of a gesture so that the evil spirit didn't bother you, and you'd go to another building and you'd leave a flower so that the good spirit uh, would favor your actions, we act them out in neurotic ways. Jung said the symptoms, the old uh, gods have become diseases. Um, so all of this stuff comes out of this shadow that gets pushed down that we don't want to look at because it's not conscious. Uh, it afflicts individuals, groups, and nations. And to bring shadow to consciousness depotentiates its power. Shadows and light. That was the Joni Mitchell song, so stay with me. For primitive people, all of life is governed by these kind of animistic assumptions. Um, at a certain level of development, that's the way humans made sense. It was trying to figure out what is inside and what is outside, what is subject and what is object. So projection, think of this like a movie projector in a theater. It takes a small image that's inside you and it puts it up on a big screen where you can really see it. This is how the unconscious material becomes conscious. It just, it's just the way human consciousness works. It's not good or bad, it's just what we do. So when you see Casablanca, and you see that story that's going on up there, it seems so real, doesn't it? So real that you have an emotional response. You get identified with certain characters. You get really into the narrative. You may even cry and laugh. That's what projection is. Just like a projector in a movie theater, we do that all the time. We take this shadow material that's inside us, and we put it up on this screen. What is the screen? The screen is others. The screen is the person you live with, the screen is the person down the block, the screen is the people you work with. That's the screen. Projecting this unconscious content into an object, it becomes accessible and we see it now. It's no longer unconscious. It's like these energies in the unconscious vying to be made conscious. And some of them get projected out onto others. Any object that's interesting provokes projections. 
Consciousness develops in civilized people by the acquisition of knowledge and the withdrawal of projections. So this is a quote from Dr. Jung, which I think is still maybe even more poignant today when you look at our social cultural experience than it was back when he wrote this. Our self-awareness is still a long way behind our actual knowledge. Projections are legion. Some of them are favorable, but unfavorable projections settle outside our circle of intimate relationships. For the primitive, anything strange is hostile and evil, which is why the normal person feels under no obligation to make these projections conscious, although they're dangerously illusory. And here's the great line. The center of all iniquity is invariably found to lie a few miles behind enemy lines. Just a few miles behind enemy lines. That's where the evil exists. Since these are unconscious, they appear in the form of either undervaluing or overvaluing. They result in quarrels, fanaticism, follies of every kind. So the shadow material has to be made conscious. Now how do we do that? Here's a little bit of research that might be of interest to you. This is from the British Psych. This is a gift from Roland. He connected me with a, a weekly report from the British Psycho Psychological Association. And they have all these studies, all these research studies, which I actually look at occasionally. And one of them said, you know, that we judge others by their actions and we judge ourselves by our intentions. <laughs> There's a study which shows this. So other people have a different kind of criteria as to, you know, are, are they acceptable and are they good? We judge them by their actions and we also instantly put a narrative. Now think of an experience in your own life. Uh, I, I gave a talk in Nashville two weekends ago, um, which was a really rich experience. It, going down to uh, country music and going and talking to people about these ideas, I thought, wow, they're not going to get this. No, they get it. They totally get it. They may have a different set of things that they project the other onto, but it still operates in the same way. Um, <clears throat> the idea here is that shadow material has to be weighed, but if we think that the other person is somehow bad because we judge them by their actions, but we're good because we judge us. Do you see the gap in that? So a little device I use, a rule of thumb, and I actually did this when I was down in Houston. One of the things I did was conflict resolution work with some nonprofit organizations. And we would use this thing where we would actually <clears throat> have the person state what their intentions were, and then the other person would say what the impact was on them. Now, I've used this in couples work as well. Um, if one person says, well, this is my intention, you know, we judge ourselves by our intentions. They were always kind of elevated. And then the other person would say, without saying, you're a stupid SOB, or, well, I don't care, you know, you're, you're really ignorant, or, you know, what are you, a Neanderthal, blah, 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 fill in the blank of whatever your political affiliation is. Um, if they could start to discuss the gap between intention and impact, real dialogue starts to happen. Because it's that gap where all the growth can occur. And this is true in couples relationships. If you can sit down and stop attacking the other person's character, which it, of course immediately throws them into a defensive posture, they can't hear anything after that. <clears throat> but if you can bracket that and hold on to that and say, well, this is the impact that it had on me. I'm going to grant you that your intention was good. But here's the impact. Now you can start to have some true dialogue. Because it's in that gap that all the growth can occur. And it's in that gap that we no longer dialogue in this society. Why? Because uh, we've already demonized the other side. They must be ignorant, stupid, unconscious. So this is going to be part of the theme here is, how do we look at our own projections and stop putting it onto the other person, our own shadow material? Uh, what is in the shadow also, under some conditions, is really useful. Um, I'm, I've got another slide later about faith communities and the projection that we put on leaders of faith communities. Um, we project our gold. We don't just project, and what's really interesting is people will resist more reclaiming their projections of their gold than they will their shadow. And I, the skeletons in the closet, they'll like 
accept, oh yeah, I'm a bad person. Oh, I'm, yeah, some shame about this piece. Or, um, but they'll fight to the death about, well, no, I'm going to put my gold onto this guru or this pastor or this person who's a leader or this increasingly celebrity person. They take all kinds of projections, gold and projections. And it oftentimes chews them up and eats them alive. Look at Marilyn Monroe, the goddess, the love goddess. Look at the projections that we put on people who are just ordinary people. They can't possibly carry the projection of the gold. So I puzzled about this for years, and finally it came to me that the reason we resist that, that would upset the ego even more, because all of its assumptions, all of its structure is based on a certain degree of kind of compromise and organizational uh, process. And to take in the fact that we all have a divine potential, and, and you know, that we should live out of that, and that we should dialogue with it on a daily basis, and that it might be possible in every relationship that we have, that's almost too much for us to take in. So we put it on to others. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. I threw this one because it just seems so applicable uh, to everything that we're seeing in the news right now. Uh, there's something contagious about negative things because negative things appeal. Remember, the ego is the organ of fear. It's trying to manage fear. There's also research that came out of the British uh, Psychology Association which shows how much uh, more receptive we are and how we remember much more negative information than positive information. Because, because remember, the ego is set up to try to it's, it's like to monitor fear and protect us from fear. That's what it's cued into. So you wonder why we have so much negative news, and you wonder why we hang on to it, because we're wired that way to a certain extent. And then we have certain people who are making profit and power out of that, and therefore you know, manipulating it and using it. So how do you know when something is a negative projection? How do you know, because you know, the person maybe really is annoying or destructive or whatever. So this is always the, kind of the question is, OK, is, is this just me or is this them? Well, the question is, the answer is it's both. Um, but a general way to know when you're projecting your own shadow is something really gets under your skin and it's driving you crazy. Like, I don't know what it is about this person, they just really irritate me. Um, it has an emotional obsessive quality, you're irritated and you can't let go of it. If hours later, before bed, you're still like, oh, I should have said this. You've been seized by a negative projection. Why is it so powerful? Because a bit of it is in you. Winston Churchill famously said, I've had to eat my own words many times, and I've always found the diet to be quite nourishing. That's admitting your own shadow. That's like taking it in. And it's very nourishing, but it's painful, because we'd rather have it out there. Put it out in the desert. Um, and it has this obsessive quality that you want to change the other person, either setting them straight, seeking revenge, or getting even. That person who cut me off in traffic, you know, who passed on the left, uh, I'm going to set them straight. I'm going to roll down the window and tell them, didn't you ever go to driving school? You know, what's wrong with you? Uh, that really helps, I'm sure. The target of another person's negative projection experiences the hatred almost physically as a projectile. I don't know if any of you ever felt this. When someone just projects something on you and you don't know what, you can feel it physically. It's like you have a kind of a nauseous feeling. The therapists in the room are going to be familiar with this. You have a client who comes in and they're going to dump all of their dysfunctional feelings and their emotional stuff, and they leave feeling so much better, and you're like. And you know, therapists know that these projections you have to arm yourself against, first of all, and secondly, you have to then sort of clear it out. Like, I go for a walk after a difficult session like that. I know when a certain client is given to these kinds of projections. At the most extreme, this is called projective identification. This is when someone who has horrible shame or anger or rage, and they dump it on you, and you feel awful. And they feel so much better. And it's important to realize that this is a very specific kind of projection that faith workers 
and therapists are going to run into. Because people come into that community because they're attracted by the love, the goodness, the gold. And they're going to project the gold onto you, but then it's going to flip at some point and they're going to project the negative crap onto you as well. There's always a hook on which the projection is hung. Um, the poet Robert Bly wrote a book called A Little Book on the Human Shadow. And he used to say, it takes a hook to hang a picture. So, you know, the person probably has that quality that's also in you, and that's why it's particularly annoying or particularly attractive, if it's a positive projection. It's your unlived potential. It's your unlived life. If you were to take it in, you would have a much better chance of having a real kind of honest communication with that person without the projection. Right? This, is, this is kind of like early uh, couples therapy, is having them look at their projections and how do they, what is the gap between what they expect the other person to be and how they really are. So there is a hook out there. So I'm not saying it's all within you. Uh, a Jungian analyst named Louise, Marie Louise von Franz has a wonderful quote where she says, even if only 3% of it is yours and 97% of it is the other person, what you can impact and change is that 3%. You're not going to have very success, very good success changing the other person. I mean, just look at how that works. They're usually not very receptive to that type of information. Uh, but by working on, even if it's only 3%, uh, you have a better chance of impacting some change. Uh, so projection of light and dark upon spiritual religious leaders and their families is inevitable. And what happens is, because there's an overestimation of light, I have worked with priests, I have worked with ministers, I have worked with uh, people in sanghas and different types of spiritual communities, and what happens is the leader carries this kind of golden light. And what happens? Well, the darkness emerges in the community. You know, through some kind of abusive situation. We've heard of that in this town. Uh, or some other type of priest abuse. Unfortunately, we've heard more and more about that. I have a client from Ireland who was so wounded uh, by that that... Uh, the way that the priest cover-up happened, and I have clients in Houston who were wounded by that type of abuse. Um, it also shows up as inflated egoism in the name of enlightenment. Oh, we're enlightened here. Um, it's an overestimation. It's projecting the positivity, the gold, out here, as opposed to taking in your rightful share of it. And so, Remember, I started by confessing that I was going to try to convince you that you have a second center. A second center, which, for lack of a better term, we could call spiritual, which is interested, my definition, in integration, create, creation, part of creation, creativity, and wholeness. I think that's also an equal impulse in us. And it's, it's as powerful as the ego. And in fact, spiritual work I wrote a book called Balancing Heaven and Earth with Robert Johnson, is balancing those two. There's a part of you that is the ego. The ego is important for balancing your checkbook, showing up in meetings on time, and we're going to see in a minute, ethical decision making. Your ego is in charge of that. The self, the higher self, the source, is this wholeness which ties you into greater sources of wisdom. And Balancing both is the art of life, I'm going to suggest. So gold in the shadow consists of those virtues which up upset the egoic order, and they get projected also. Uh, one of my mentors, Robert Johnson, used to tell the story where he had, he had little pieces of fool's gold, you know, pyrite, those of you who are rock hounds, in his uh, bookshelf. And when someone would come in with this, he would give him a little piece of pyrite and say, carry this around in your pocket for a week. And then they'd come back for the next session. He'd say, well, so are you ready to take your gold back or are you still going to project it onto others? I mean, it was, it was a, a literal kind of reminder of the fact that you need to take back your own gold, your own divine potential, your own capacity for relating to others as not objects, but as other um, whole beings. 
Uh, compassion fatigue and burnout results from carrying these projections. I skipped that slide. Any of you in the faith communities know this? Any of you have been, uh, you know, in charge of those communities? know this experience of compassion and burnout. Any of you ever worked on a hotline, a suicide hotline, or any kind of uh, mental health program, know that one of the things you have to look at is when other people are projecting their stuff on you, how are you going to protect yourself? How are you going to take care of yourself? And how are you not going to get inflated by their positive projections? So when somebody tells you how wonderful you are, just wait about a month. Because if they're overinflating you, they're going to come back at some point and they're going to really, you know, rip you a new one. Because you're not living up to that ideal. This is a real problem in faith communities, you know, where people are expected to be, and it's a real problem for the children of ministers, who I've also worked with, who felt like they had to be perfect. They couldn't be human. They couldn't have a shadow. So what happens, the shadow gets pushed down. It gets repressed even more. And of course, it comes out in all kinds of kind of unadapted, not very pretty ways. So five stages in retrieving the shadow. How do we take this back? Uh, first of all, you can notice when you project it, there's a sense of diminishment. You can feel like something, something is just off here. I don't feel right. I, uh, it can also show up as hostility and rage and irritability. And at some point, the projection starts to rattle. This is what von Franz called it. Projections start to wobble. Something doesn't quite fit. Maybe your partner or a friend tells you, you know, I don't think that person is quite the way you're perceiving them. Or maybe you start to realize that the thing that you've put on your partner, well, she's not always that bad, or he's not always this way. When that starts to rattle, that's an opportunity, because at that point, you have an opportunity to pull back the projection. Generally, what we try to do is we try to refit it and reinstall the projection. How do we do that? Through uh, seeking out one-sided opinions that agree with us. So if we were to start to see that the person in the other political party actually maybe had something that aligned with their values that was important to hear, what would we do? Well, we would tend to go to dinner with people who think like we do. This is, again, from the research that shows this. This is what humans do, because it keeps everything kind of in order. We'd rather have the stability of dysfunction than the health of something new that feels scary and uncertain. We'd rather hang on to dysfunction. This is the business that I'm in as a therapist, is trying to con convince people that it's OK to let go of the dysfunctional structure that they're so attached to. Um, Alan Watts talks about that that's what the ego is. It's a big ball of stuff that it's so stable because it never changes, because we hang on to it throughout life, and that's what the identity is. Like, I'm a victim, or I'm wounded, or our family blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to that because it would change things, and we would rather stay attached to that which seems stable, even though it's just an abstraction, a bunch of abstract thoughts that together make up the ego. Well, I know that. It's one thing I can count on. Again, remember, we're talking about anxiety management. If I can't manage my anxiety with stability and surety in this world, well, then I'll project it into the next world. At least that world, surely, I can count on. And so we start to make that really fixed as opposed to possibly being dynamic and changing. Um, that's probably another talk where we talk about, you know, sort of fundamentalism versus comparative. And that, that's kind of a religious studies talk, which I'm not going to do tonight, but I'm trying to plant some seeds for you to think about in terms of what, what I do, which is psychology, how this might impact your own experience, that we'd rather hang on to that which is stable, even though it's abstract and probably distorted and maybe very dysfunctional. Um, so in retrieving the shadow, after desperately trying to hang on to our one-sided beliefs and surround ourselves with people who think like we do, cold-hearted conservatives, naive liberals, negative patriarchs, at some point, the alternative would be to look at your own sense of diminish diminishment. 
What I despise out there always relates to something that's inadequately integrated in me. The last step of this is called eating your shadow, and that involves reflection. We see this in 12-step protocols and groups, uh, in grief groups, and imagination groups. Uh, activity that involves reflection and sometimes reparation for the fact that we've been misperceiving things. Uh, as the human psyche is capable of projecting parts of itself into the environment, we oftentimes experience this as a judgment of evil. Now, I'm seeing more and more of that today. These people are evil. Um, so I want to spend just a moment, and again, this is another whole lecture that I, I give, which is about the nature of evil, but I want to suggest to you that evil is a judgment, and evil and ethics are made by the ego, and the ego is always relative. And since it's a category of thought, evil in the hands of someone who's unconscious, that judgment may be very unreliable. But we have people putting that forth as gospel truth. Well, these people are evil. And again, I'm not going to take any side of the political. You can see it on both sides. We judge that which is outside. And, 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 and there's a habit in, in faith communities of doing this kind of splitting into good and evil. And it gets tossed around pretty loosely right now, is all I will say, in terms of as opposed to, oh, this person may have different values of mine. So I'm going all the way back here to Oliver Cromwell in 1650, who addressed the General Assembly and said, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible that you may be mistaken. And it's my hope that you would carry that out with you tonight. Think it possible that you may be mistaken. I have no doubt that all of us carry with us aspects of truth. And I think probably everyone in this room wouldn't be here tonight if you weren't an ethical person, because you've self-selected to come to a program like this that is reflective and trying to figure out you know, what would be a more compassionate, a more honest, a more uh, integrated way of being in the world. Um, but when we kind of categorize that into absolute categories, we create questionable judgments. I think that we all need to have a moral compass. We have to discern the moral compass, and that's why I use this metaphor of the center to talk about tonight. What interferes with our discernment of our moral compass? Distortions. When we have high anxiety, our discernment goes way down. So we have to have healthy ways of managing our anxiety, not kind of passing trivial ones that are encouraged by our culture. Shopping, internet pornography, alcohol, uh, recreational sexuality and drug use. I'm not against any of those, but what happens in our culture is those become anxiety management systems. Instead of reaching for our own center, whether it's through meditation, an exercise like we did today of just stopping the thoughts, looking for that still small voice within, uh, we substitute these other things. And we're encouraged to do that because other people retain their power, their privilege, and their profits by manipulating us to do anxiety management in that way, as opposed to really trying to look at what is it in me that is anxious? Who in me gets so anxious? Well, it's the ego. The ego is the organ to try to manage fear. And when you're out of that egoic place, and we live in egoic times, where people think that that's all there is, is the ego. That's the measure of all things. It's a materialistic, reductionistic world. We're floating around in a meaningless universe. One can draw that conclusion that, well, so I guess we should be hedonistic and squeeze as much pleasure, and like the old bumper sticker, he who ends up with the most toys wins. But I'm suggesting to you that I think that is not satisfying, that that is not ultimately what produces the best moral decisions, the best ethical decisions, because what happens is 
we have to test for validity. And to test for the validity, because as I've told you, our perception is always relative and partial, we have to be able to withstand ambivalence and uncertainty and not thinking that we have the whole answer. To be ethical is an essential human task. Humans, when they look above, uh, we're looking for a higher part of ourselves as well as looking into the universe. What part of us, other than the organ of fear and desire, is engaged in our decision making? And I believe we have to struggle with these questions of discernment, that they shouldn't just be taken as uh, truth. So people ask me when I give this talk, well, so are you just, is this like just go with the flow, you know, kind of a hippie, trust uh, what is, kind of a very distorted view of Eastern thought, which is not that in the first place, but um, the more we get committed to a particular course of action, the more resistant we are to information that threatens that course. I think one of the things that, well, I learned from one of my heroes was, um, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, and even he's being attacked now by fundamentalists in India and tearing down his monument and shameful, awful things that are going on in this whole polarity that exists in our culture now, in the world's particular stage of evolution where things are no longer being integrated but instead being split in this very primitive defense against anxiety. Um, Gandhi, when he died, some of you may know, he had like seven possessions. He had a dhoti, and he had a walking stick, and he had a, some spectacles, and he had a copy of the Bhagavad Gita. And some of you who uh, came to an earlier talk I gave for Interface have heard this, but I'll repeat it. The Bhagavad Gita, the essential message in that, if I was to boil it down, is to let go of the fruits of your desiring. Participate in life. We have to make ethical decisions. We have to get out and vote. We have to stop things that we think are wrong, but always kind of feeling like, I don't know exactly how I'm going to get there. Letting go of the fruits of it. That if you can do that, you can participate and say yes to life. So I'm not saying go be an ascetic and re, you know, retire from life. Separate the gap between your intentions and your impact on others and try to look at what is that gap. Try to let go of, it has to go this way, Keep your eye on the prize and um, continue to be active in life. Um, this is from Martin Buber. Buber had the idea, many of you have probably read, uh, it's very difficult to read I and Thou because of the way it's translated. It's, uh, but there's a book called uh, The Way of Man, which I highly commend to you. But the concept of Buber here is that how do we take I and it relationships where we treat the other as an object? Any of you have ever been abused as a child know what that's like, to be treated like an object. It's for someone else's use. Um, many of us encounter it in day-to-day -day experience. If you work retail, you're very familiar with being treated like an object. You're the person that's supposed to just help the person get whatever it is that they want. There's not an I and thou. I and thou is seeing the other person with their full potentiality. It's operating out of that second center of the self, which is looking for integration, creation, and greater wholeness, and seeing that potential in every opportunity, every relationship. It's pausing and being still for a moment, and instead of going to a narrative about this person and how other they are, that's an I and thou relationship. It's seeing that they have, as Buber says, a divine spark within them, and that the divine spark is distributed throughout the universe. Another uh, quote that I very much like is from a medieval mystic, Nicholas of Cusa, and it says that God is a circle, God is a circle whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere. I try to live with that. God is a circle whose center is everywhere. In other words, this is a beautiful room and we're in a, a religious gathering place. But I try to look for it in day-to-day -day ordinary things, the ordinarily sacred. God is a circle whose center is everywhere, and circumference is beyond our knowing. That's what he's saying. It's beyond the capacity of that little ego, which is a habit nature's gotten itself into, 
to even comprehend. Uh, well, let's skip this one. Dilemma of modern democracies, you all know that. It's how in a pluralistic society, how do we tolerate difference? Particularly when others are trying to impose their difference on us. This is a real dilemma that we have, isn't it? I'm just trying to give you some tools to do that as effectively as possible. Uh, society and government based on free speech and exchange of ideas leads to better decisions, but that implies that there's a center that we can hold where we can have some dialogue, where we can look at the gap between our intentions and our impact and hear it from others. That's where the growth occurs. This is a, a quote from uh, Florida Scott Maxwell. She was a patient of Jung's, but she's written a book. Just look it up online. I can't recall the title of it, which is beautifully written. And I know this is small print, but I couldn't find it in me to edit this, so I'm just going to read it to you. Out of evil, much good has come to me. By keeping quiet, repressing nothing, remaining attentive, by accepting reality, taking things as they are and not as I wanted them to be. By doing all this, unusual knowledge has come to me, such as I could never have imagined before. I always thought that when we accepted things, they overpowered us in some way or other. This turns out not to be true at all. Now She wrote this when she was in her 90s, just by the way. Um, so now I intend to play the game of life, being receptive to whatever comes to me, good and bad, sun and shadow, forever alternating, and in this way also accepting my own nature with its positive and negative sides. Thus everything becomes more alive to me. What a fool I was. How I tried to force everything to go according to the way I thought it ought to. That's Florida Scott Maxwell. God bless her. With that, I'm going to stop. You've had enough slides. You've been sitting a long time. Feel free to get up and have a cookie and stretch. But let's now have a dialogue. I'd love to hear, let's put this into practice. I'd love to hear how any of this speaks or doesn't speak to you and experiences and how we might just be able to create a collective space here that would be safe, safe for us to share how we've been impacted by tonight, the week, the world.